Welcome, everyone. Welcome to the Spring 2023 New Jersey Film Festival Filmmaker Interview Series, Q&A Series. We've been doing a number of these after COVID broke out and everything had to be done online. Uh, we've been interviewing filmmakers from around the world, and I think this is probably my 105th interview um, since we've been doing it. We, you know, the, the New Jersey Film Festival is biannual, and we've been able to do about 10 to 15 uh, filmmakers per season. And we also have an international film festival in June. So I did the math and I think it's a hundred, this is the 105th one. And um, it's something that we are still doing, even though the film festival is now in person again, um, we've decided to maintain the hybrid format since there's a number of people wow. that have are now fans of our festival that do not live close by. Um, and we wanted to keep them in the loop. So the spring 2023 New Jersey Film Festival will be taking place from January 27th through February 19th on Fridays, Saturdays, and Sundays. And they will be available in person either at 5 p.m. or 7 p.m., depending on the show. And each program is available for 24 hours to watch um, through our Eventive website, which I will show you guys at the end of this program. But today we have two documentarians here, and I invited them both to be part of this um, uh, of this uh, Q and A because they both focus on New Jersey artists, and I thought it would be nice to have them also ask themselves as questions about their work. Casey Child made Rembrandt in New Jersey, which is a a short documentary about Helen Frank, who's just an amazing artist, and Michael Callis did a film about his dad. Um, and so we're going to be focusing on his film, Man Fire Clay. And uh, Michael's film is closer to feature length, but they both, I, I wish both of the films were longer. They're so great. There's so much information. I, I actually wanted more after I saw these films. That's how good they are. So welcome, guys. Welcome to uh, the Q&A session today. Thanks for having us. Yeah, thanks. Our it's good to be here. All right, so I guess I will start with uh, Rembrandt in New Jersey since uh, uh, Casey is right next to me. Casey actually lives in Burlington, Vermont. Um, and I guess that's my question. How did you end up making a film about a New Jersey artist? Um, I don't know if you can see behind me, I, I have a Helen Frank piece hanging and um, I've been collecting her work for a number of years mm. and um, got to know her as I work as an art dealer too and got to know her through that. And, um, you know, before I knew her personality, I, I was curious that maybe she'd be a good documentary subject. And I got to meet her. And as you can see in the film, she's pretty uh, eccentric and uh, quirky. So, you know, I, I thought she would be interesting if, if she was a, as, uh, as dynamic of a person. So I just, I asked her and she said nobody else had asked her. So that's how, it and I think about. it's, you know, she's she's now 92, right? And so yes. it's really great. I didn't know anything about her. And I, I really, I'm also an art collector as well um, on the side. And I, I end up buying work of the art that I see in the movies that we see. So it's not something that, that's atypical for me to do. And I thought, wow, this stuff is really great. I wonder if it's affordable. So that's a question I'll ask you after the Q&A. But Michael, you, you ended up doing this film is it, I mean, obviously you share some similarities with your dad in the sense that you found your calling in film because your film is really tight, very interesting. And I wonder how how difficult it is, is it to work with your dad? I mean, did, <laughs> did you have complete editorial control in what you were doing? I guess he's a co-producer too. So I, I wonder, sure. yeah, yeah, tell us about yeah. the process. So, um, you know, my dad being an artist, he's been at this uh, wood fire ceramic style of art um, for 50 years now. And, you know, it, it, in the film, we go into a little detail of how he got to wood fire. But his, um, I mean, it was to him, it was either I'm going to learn how to play guitar or I'm going to, you know, do clay. And <laughs> the story he tells is at the time he was looking around and he saw guys like Jimi Hendrix and Jimmy Page and all these guys. He's like, I, I can't, I, I have to. I can't compete with those guys. So he's always been an artist, sure. Um, and uh, in that, he's got a really good, uh, he's got really good sensibilities that um, span all different uh, genres. 
Um, but your your question was, you know, how was it difficult? Was it, you know, and 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 how much control did uh, did we cede to the talent being my father? And, yeah. You know, it was it, it was excellent having somebody with um, an artistic eye that had absolutely, uh, or I should say, very limited media experience and mm. you know, multimedia. Mm. Um, he saw things that you know uh, a, a seasoned beginner would would see, uh, mm. which is a weird thing to kind of say. Um, but how it ended up working out was uh, we'd actually created two films off of this. Uh, we yeah. created a short, short version mm. uh, that Peter uh, really had a lot of control over. Um, mm. the, the idea was that this would be a companion piece to travel with him from gallery to exhibit to workshop. That he could show a tight 20 or so minute film mm. in, in conjunction with the rest of uh, his presentation. And then we, in, in doing so, we realized we had this a excellent opportunity. We shot way too much footage. So we have uh, all this really great stuff. Um, and in that, uh, the idea of the feature was born. And uh, we did take a lot of Peter's creative notes. We did. Um, it was a different sort of process, though. So um, while one was more of a, a companion piece to, you know, his um his career, you know, in workshops and gallery exhibits. Uh, mm -hmm. There's another piece more intended for the general audience that doesn't necessarily understand the ceramic community. Yeah. Um, so it was helpful to have him on both, but one was really, uh, you know, his song and the other was more of a song of him. Yeah. And I mean, I think if you have so much footage, if you go to a, like a, a 58 minute version, which is, I, I think you should definitely, I, I don't know if you've, uh, hooked up with any of the PBS channels around here, but it's a no-brainer for me uh, for you to go a go after those people. And you know, and I think it, it, there's a variety of ways to do that that I can tell you more about after we finish. But I think I, I'd love to have that conversation. Absolutely. Yeah, I think I think both of your films um, could could benefit by being longer, and you know, because I, like I said, you're just scratching at the surface, and there's so many things that I think you could dive into further, like. Um, you know, for Helen, how difficult was it for her to be able to work as a as a woman in a kind of man's art world? And um, for Peter, who was mentoring with one of the great sculptors, um, you know, how difficult was it for him? Um, you know, there's you mentioned it in your documentary that there was a, a kind of brotherhood, but that there was a violation of that brotherhood. And that could be expanded upon, too. And I also was kind of completely taken aback in um, Michael's documentary that when Peter went to Japan to look into doing um, work there, that because he was a left handed a sculptor that they didn't want to have anything to do with them because the strokes would go the wrong way. So, I mean, I, you know, it seems pretty clear that in both of your documentaries that the, the artists had challenges and that could be fleshed out a little bit more in your films for sure. But did, is that something that you think about doing? I mean, Casey, do you think about maybe making a feature length version? Yeah, it um it originally my plan was this, you know, 10 hour, 10 episode opus of Helen. Mm -hmm. And I had a longer version. And um, you know, with her turning 92, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I was getting a little internal and ex external pressure to make sure to finish something so right, that she right. could, you know, she's in good shape and she doesn't seem 92, but Several times she reminded me that, you know, I'm I'm in my 90s. I'd like to see something. Mm -hmm. So I decided to um, finish a short version to submit to Sundance in time for that. Right. Which didn't work out. But I do have a lot of footage that I haven't used. Mm -hmm. um, so I do plan on um, expanding. And it just for me as a editor and filmmaker, I have to like it's such a intensive experience that I really have to be ready for that. And it's in, in the winter, I feel like it's easier for me to edit when there's not as many excuses to go, go for a bike ride or something. <laughs> I hear yeah. you, I hear you. So it's warm by a PC, isn't it? I mean, yeah. Bel Belvedere is up near the mountains too, right? Uh, sure. Michael, you're up uh, up near, and uh, uh, up North Jersey in bear country. So yes, think, yeah. You know, the foothills of the Appalachian, if you... Yeah, yeah, that's really great. What is that river that's in the scene where your dad's in his studio? 
Yeah, it's actually sitting right. I'm actually at my father's house now. Very um, cool. But yeah, that's the Pequest River. Um, the Pequest mm -hmm. River feeds into the Delaware. And uh, it's the river that I grew up on. It's um, one of the many uh, little little waterways of New Jersey, um, but it's it's mine. So um, very cool. Yeah, it's yeah. beautiful. It's a nice. It's a beautiful view from his office. And I think you know, I was thinking about that when I was watching. I wonder where that is. Very cool. Do you guys have questions to ask each other? Yeah, I've, I've got a question. Um, when you were filming in the kiln, did you just pick a camera you were willing to sacrifice, or how did you? Yeah, you know, I'm glad that you asked that because that's uh, that segment, the, in, the inside the kiln is um, easily the most uh, discussed uh, and, and has the most questions behind it. Um, in fact, I have some colleagues that work in visual effects out in Los Angeles. And when I uh, finished that section, uh, there, there was a little bit of a, an edit of it ended up being recut for the film, but there was a bit of an edit with the shots that we ended up using. And I sent it out to see how it was feeling with my community and all the people that work in visual effects they uh they said who who did the graphics for this because i i it, it doesn't have any of the tells of fake fire uh it looks like very real fire mm -hmm. and that's when i had i broke the news that we actually stuck a camera in there and like no way <laughs> so um but yeah no we we had this idea um it was born at uh, uh in the community of um the people you know working the firing uh, someone had an idea, another idea, boom, boom. And then eventually, what if we put the camera inside the kiln and my brain starts running? Um, how could we possibly do this? It's also, we're on a ticking clock given that, um, you know, the firing only goes for about a week. Mm -hmm. um, and, the, and the best time to really be inside the kiln, if there is a best time, uh, there's a very short window where the temperature is just hot enough to get really dynamic looks and the fire is big enough to actually have some sort of cascading effects. Mm -hmm. um, so to answer your question directly, we, we decided to sacrifice a, Go, a GoPro. Um, we ended up buying a GoPro Hero Black. Um, just, it was like 300 and something dollars. Mm -hmm. um, we went to a local hardware store. Um, we bought uh, what's known as KO wool, which is refractory wool. It's just a really strong insulating, um, you know, uh, fiber material. Mm -hmm. and uh some sheet metal um we sourced a piece of glass that's temperature graded to 4000 degrees um put it all together on a steel rod and had one of the fire experts one of the um, stoking experts uh who knew the placement of the pieces i i wanted to stick it in but you know <laughs> that <laughs> I don't. <laughs> uh, they're very protective of what goes in that kiln so we had a uh, we had an expert man the camera um, and each shot was pretty much a one to two to three second dip in, pull out at 240 frames. Um, and we had to immediately run that camera back to the to the work workshop, disassemble it, hit it with a blow gun, cool it down and hope that the footage mm -hmm. made it. Yeah, because the internal components of the camera only uh, they, they, the manual recommends that it doesn't exceed 212 degrees and we're in oh, 3000 yeah. degrees. So so, yeah. Um, we actually ended up salvaging the camera. It, it only had some, um, you know, uh, cosmetic issues. Uh, the plastic uh, casing started degrading under the heat, but otherwise all the internal components survived. Uh, it's still usable today. In fact, the lens has some heat uh, destruction on the, on the <laughs> periphery of it, but as long as you don't go on wide, you don't see it. So it's uh, pretty, pretty remarkable. Yeah. Or you could make a really shot. great experimental film with that crazy film. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and uh, and it turns out, you know, we were able to, We, I'm sure, Casey, you have a, a similar experience with this as documentary uh, ends up being quite gorilla. Um, that shot was by far, uh, or that series of three shots, by far the most expensive uh, part of the film, just simply given the fact that we had to sac sacrifice a GoPro camera. Um, but well worth it. Well worth it. It was a great Thank shot. You. Thank you. Thank you. Michael, do you have a question for uh, yeah. Casey? Yeah, I actually, I actually do. So, um, so how, what was it like working, um, with, uh, uh, with her? It, 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 she's such a firecracker. Um, was there, uh, it, it seems like, um, uh, what, yeah, just what was the process like working with her? Yeah. Um, it was amazing. I mean, she's inspired me. I'm a 
I'm a painter too. And just, just learning the mindset of an artist who, you know, like who finds so much joy in life and what they do was really just amazing. And she was really, um, she would give me feedback, but she was very thoughtful and, you know, we're interviewing her in front of the, the old horse from the merry-go-round. And then, so she shows me a, the process of an etching of the merry-go-round. So just kind of like piecing things together for me without telling me what to do mm -hmm. was, um, was really helpful. And um, it was, you know, it just overall just so inspiring. Just, uh, you know, I'm in my mid thirties and just that's, that's who I want to be at 92, just still going and finding joy and just her perspective on life was, um, was really um, eye opening. How did, how did you discover her art though? Um, th there was a, I used to live in New Jersey and there was a gallery that I would go to as an art dealer and became a fan of her work. And then I started collecting her work. You know, I put Google alerts online when her stuff would come for sale and um, just slowly started collecting. It was probably seven or 10 years ago. Um, Very cool. Yeah. The, the process that she used is something that I was not familiar with. I, I mean, I'm familiar with woodcuts mm -hmm. and silk screening, and it seems like it's someplace in between where you're etching metal yeah than printing off of, i mean how 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 popular is that kind of technique is it something you find often in the art world um it's it's um it's not i've tried to take lessons in it it's hard to to mm. find anyone doing it very often um mm. the copper is very expensive and it's very it's very labor intensive as you can see from the film that you mm. know people think it's a print like it's uh, off an Epson or a printer or something, but it's so yeah. much, so much work goes into More it. More labor intensive, yeah. And I mean, yeah. what if you make a mistake and you don't, how, how you cover up your your tracks on copper must be an art in itself, so. Oh yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, so it's it's not, um, there are people that do it, but it's not easily accessible. Um, and it's, the chemicals are, are a little safer now, but it was pretty toxic. Yeah, yeah. Ago. That's amazing that she's up to 92. I, I know a filmmaker who did something similar using film, a guy named Stan Brackage, and he ended up getting prostate cancer and, you know, he didn't make it past the 70s. So, mm -hmm. But I had a, another question for you, Peter, before we uh, show folks how to buy tickets, is that your your dad is still, is he still actively making? Yeah, yeah. So he's actually, uh, he's, he's on a trip now, but um, he's returning today. Uh, okay. But the trip kind of came at a, uh, a a rough point for him because he was just getting back in the studio mm -hmm. um, since his last since his most recent tour of his exhibit. Mm -hmm. um, and some of the work that he's doing right now is, um, you know, I, and as a, a, someone who was born and raised in an art commune, essentially, I mean, they would my parents were both artists and they would run sort of workshops out of the house and almost every week weekend there mm. were you know artists and people sharing rooms and stuff like that so mm. um very a you know a, a not typical um way to be raised so there was a lot of uh, exposure to art early on um and so maybe that's the, the only thing i can credence like my artistic eye to mm. uh but i i do see you know the 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 um uh the the styling that my dad does and and in in the world as a like an instant old kind of thing mm. and there's a there's a charm to that there's a really uh something that you can kind of pull from and and feel yourself you know so i i see that the work he's doing now is sort of breaking those bounds um in in a real interesting way so i'm pretty excited to see and again you know just like most art um you're not going to really know what you have until you're done. So yeah. uh, just seeing what he's doing now, it's, uh, it's exciting. You know, um, it's all, I dare say he, I mean, he's 70. Uh, so I dare say he's breaking out of a comfort zone um, mm. because that's probably what he's been doing his entire career, you know, yeah. at least internally. Um, but this is a real interesting step. So I'm excited think, to see how it turns out in the kiln. It seems like that he's, 
that was one of the things that you mentioned in the, that he mentions in the documentary that he wanted to break with the kind of formal traditions. So I, I think yeah. folks, you've got to absolutely see these two documentaries that you will want, you will want to come to the live screening because both these guys will be there. The artists will be there. So you'll have a chance to oh, interact excellent. with them. And um, we will be showing right next to the Zimmerly Art Museum, which is the Rutgers University uh, art museum that has wonderful exhibits and they they I'm working on getting them to partner with us for the screening so it should be a lot of fun let let me just kind of um share screen with you uh, with the audience now so they can see where uh they can buy tickets so we hit share screen and then we hit this guy and so normally folks would go to our website which is njfilmfest.com and in the past, everything has been here, but with the, with us doing hybrid screenings, we partnered with Eventive and I pushed the entire website onto their site, which makes it just a little bit more practical. You can buy tickets there and the ticket is good for the in-person screening as well as the hybrids, uh, the uh, online screening. So when you get to our website, um, by the way, in the background, this is the location, Voorhees Hall is where we'll be screening. And you just click on current events, which bounces you back down uh, one notch um, and gives you basic general information here. Tickets are $15 per program. An all access pass is $100. If you want to see everything, it's like a half price. So it's a really great deal. And if you're a student and you come to the in-person show, it's only 10 bucks. Um, the key thing is to punch this little red button and that bounces you to our Eventive site. And the Eventive site is pretty user-friendly. Um, you just kind of hover over one of the screenings and our screening is down here. Um, it's part of a shorts program, even though um, uh, Michael's film is 41 minutes. I, I wanted to include it with Rembrandt in New Jersey, as well as a series of animation films. So it's kind of got an art bent to it. And so if you hover over this, you'll see pre-order now, you click on that, and it bounces you to the site where you can buy tickets. You click on the pre-order button now, and you can cycle through and see all of the various films that are being offered. Here's Helen Frank working on the etching. I really like that triptych shot that you provided us with. And this is a shot of, oh, we can't see Peter's face. And you'd have to go to the schedule page, which we'll do now too. So you can explore the festival site. This is the welcome page, which has got basic information. If you're gonna to come to the live screenings, you wanna click on the parking link and register your vehicle. Um, that way you can park in the university lots that are close to our site. Um, you click on uh, film guide, it gives you an overview of all of the films. And as you scroll down, you'll see, oh, this is the poster for, oh, there's a nice photo of Peter. And this gives you basic information about the film. You can go back and see Rembrandt in New Jersey and nice old photos of, of Helen. And you can go back up to the top and see where it says schedule. This is a linear version that has big pictures of all the movies that we're showing. We're showing 45 films and there are 28 of them that are part of the New Jersey Film Festival. And we're also doing a smaller festival within the New Jersey Film Festival called the United States Super 8 Film and Digital Video Festival. So that'll be on the 18th and 19th of um, February, but this is the place to go. And this gives you all the information about everything that we're showing and a place where you can buy tickets. Once you buy a ticket here, we will have a list of everybody who bought a ticket at the box office. So you can come in person. You don't need to worry about bringing tickets or anything. So I'm going to stop sharing and uh, say thank you to both of you. Um, uh, for doing this Q&A. And there will be the opportunity for our audiences to see other interviews with uh, both of these guys. Um, we'll be doing an EBTV interview, which will be broadcast throughout Central Jersey. And it'll also be on YouTube. So you look out for those guys too. Thanks again, gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Al. And Casey, right. it was a pleasure. Thank nice you.